You are watching Tomoko Music Channel. Thank you for subscribing and sharing. This is Songwriter's Room, and I'm your host, Tomoko. Today's guest is Ron Kobayashi. Ron Kobayashi is a world-class jazz pianist, composer, producer, and educator. Ron has played with Mel Tome, Margaret Whitting, Peter Frampton, Peter White, Tom Scott, and Kenny Barrow, among many others. His albums have received airplay around the world. He served for five years as a music director for the Hollywood Diversity Awards, where stars such as Chris Rock, Mark Ruffalo, and George Lopez were honored. Ron's trio was voted Best Jazz Group in Orange County by readers of the OC Weekly in 1996 and nominated for Best Jazz at the Orange County Music Awards in 2012. They also played for President Bill Clinton in 1992. So can I get a whoop whoop? Woo woo! <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gents, please welcome Ron Kobayashi! Thank you, Tomoko. It's so great to be with you. Thank you so much. I wish I were with you in Hawaii or wherever you are. Oh, you're Bahama. <laughs> yeah, oh, Bahamas. Okay. <laughs> oh, right off the bat, can you give us a little something, some little taste of you? Playing? Sure, sure. I'll do a tune I wrote called Waltz for Bill, one of my jazz heroes, Bill Evans. And this is obviously a waltz. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate you for being on my show today because I know you just recently lost your dearest father. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm really sorry for your loss. You know, I, I saw your Facebook post with a picture of your father. I can see that he was such a sweet and caring man. And you really loved him. The greatest man I've ever known. Oh, what was the best thing that you learned from him? You know, there are so many things, but just love and patience he was the most patient kind gentle man i've wow. ever known and i i strive to be like that i am definitely not like that and i strive to be like that so it's just a goal i've kind of set for myself to try to be more like my father uh, but one of the things that he's given me that's just been lifelong and long lasting is his love of jazz i'm a i'm a jazz musician today because of him Yes, I was going to ask you about that. So he was a musician too? Yeah, he was a jazz saxophonist in Hawaii. But both my mom and dad grew up in Hawaii, born and raised in Hawaii and grew up in Hawaii. And in his youth, he used to play jazz saxophone. And then he came out to the mainland here and had my sister and I and passed on his love of jazz to both of us. Um, and my mom used to play ukulele. So Ooh. she too was musically inclined. Uh, so both of them really passed it on. But my dad was the jazz musician, and, and now I'm playing jazz for a living. So I, I owe that all to him. How awesome is that? So Kobayashi is a Japanese name. Did that come from your father's side or? From my father's side, yes. And yeah, my, mom, my mom's maiden name is Sasaki. Sasaki, so both are Japanese. Uh-huh, yes. So you are the third generation of Japanese, what we call Sansei. I think someone told me I'm fourth generation. Oh, fourth generation. Yeah. 
So therefore, you don't speak Japanese at all? Unfortunately not. I wish I could. <laughs> it's so embarrassing, but yeah. Because you do look like one of my uncles. <laughs> yeah, <I> see? <laughs> I had the honor of playing with your trio when I stopped by the, yes. at the club in Orange County. And your piano skills are all of this world. And you also got a lot of soul. And your, and your bassist and drama also so perfectly sync. Thank you. How long have you guys been playing together? Yeah, we've been together about 28 years now. Wow. Well, yeah, the same three guys, myself, Bob Elefanti on bass and Steve Dixon on drums. And we've been doing it, yeah, for 28 years. So part of the reason why I think we can kind of mind read each other musically is just the fact that we've been playing together so much for so long. And that just comes from, from time. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you play with uh, many vocalists as yes. well as instrumentalists, people like Mel Tome and Margaret Whitting. You know, how was it like to play with such supreme singers? Well, I was scared to death. Uh, I did just a couple concerts with Mel Tome and it I was just really, really frightened because he's, you know, obviously uh, a legend and has apparently perfect pitch and perfect everything else about his artistry but it was it was a lot of fun and it was great to play like he wrote the christmas tune you know that one the that's mel torme's tune so we got to actually play mel torme's christmas song with mel torme and i think the concert was in i think it was like uh april or may or something like that <laughs> and we're playing the christmas song but <laughs> Well, he was definitely a perfectionist, a little scary. He heard things, um, even that I was playing, that he had to correct that I didn't think anybody could hear, but he had such an incredible wow. ear. He would hear things and say, oh, you're putting this in the chord and I'd rather want this. So it was, uh, it was definitely a, a, a great experience and allowed me to really realize what it takes to, you know, to be able to play with someone of that stature and to really be honed in on your skill and, and have everything down perfectly because they hear everything. Wow. Did you have one rehearsal? Yeah, yeah. I had a rehearsal and it was with a big band and it was, uh, like I said, it was really, really wonderful. But I work that I primarily work with, with vocalists. I love working with vocalists. And if I just did a gig this week with great vocalist named Andrew Miller uh, and we work together a lot. I just love, I think because I don't sing, I love as a pianist working with vocalists because kind of through them, I'm able to sing through my accompaniment. And so I really, really enjoy it. And not, I, I talk to a lot of pianists that, that don't, they don't enjoy working with vocalists, but I personally really do. I, I, uh, I find vicariously. That, absolutely, vicariously through the singer, I'm, I'm singing, even though <laughs> I have a horrid voice to sing. <laughs> So you also played for Bill Clinton. That's amazing. How did it come about? That was great. He came to Orange County and they needed a band. We put together a band. And I, if you remember, he used to play saxophone. Yes. So he came up and passed by the band and we asked him if he'd like to play. And he was busy schedules. He said, I, he can't, couldn't. Oh. But I thought that would have been such a great thrill if he would have play, been able to play saxophone. With but being that he was governor and became president, I'm sure he didn't have much time to, to practice. Mm -hmm. um, he could at least play and he could appreciate music. He really appreciated, obviously, I just, you know, the artists that he had at the White House, the, all the, the jazz and classical artists and rock artists he had at the White House. He really appreciated the arts. And I think partly because he was a musician mm -hmm. that he played, he, he played saxophone. Well, I think you and your trio deserve to be known on a global scale, but you love to play for the vocals, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Why is that? I, actually, I like to play in my trio because I get to do my original compositions, which is kind of the thing that I'm, I'm most proud of and that I really want to get out there. That um, so that's, that's kind of my number one thing. Um, but outside of that, I love playing. I play in, in many, many other bands in the county. Um, and I love doing every different kind of instrumentation because it gives me a chance to, like if I'm playing with a saxophone player, to to accompany a saxophone player and to have interplay with the saxophone player. When I play with a, a singer, have that whole thing, like we're talking about vicariously being able to sing through the singer and, and accompanying the singer or playing in a bigger band where I'm have a, maybe even a different role um, is, is really fun to, to me. So even though my trio is kind of my number one project, 
Um, I love really branching out and doing these other things because it just it, it just makes playing jazz for a living interesting. I'm not doing the same thing all the time. Yes. I know you're also a teacher. What can a student expect from you? I teach at the Orange County School of the Arts, uh, Biola University here in, in Orange County, and teaching jazz improv at Biola. And I teach... Um, hmm. P beginning piano and musical theater conservatory at OSHA, jazz piano in the jazz conservatory, and then um, two keyboard classes in the what we call popular music conservatory. Oh. Um, and basically, so they're all keyboard classes, piano classes. Um, basically, what I really expect from my students is to have the ability by the time they graduate to either go into the, for OSHA, which is a high school, to go into the university and be able to nail auditions and get into whatever university program they, they so wish, or if they plan to go into music professionally, be able to go into that field and fit right in. That is my number one goal. That is my expectation, is that they get to that level. Um, and so while I teach them all the techniques to do whatever they're doing, if it's in musical theater, then in musical theater, if it's popular music and popular music, I want to make sure above all that they are um, ready and able to do whatever it takes post high school. I think that's, that is so important that we, as educators, we go beyond what was expected of just that specific class and make sure that when they've graduated, they are completely ready to you know, go to USC for a music audition or go to Berkeley College of Music for, a, for an audition and nail the audition. Or if they plan to go into music professionally, be able to go into any genre of music, be able to play jazz, be able to play pop, be able to play hip hop, be able to play country, whatever it is that they're prepared for it. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a, a daunting task as an educator because there's so much that needs to be taught, but that's always my goal. Mm, so you give them routines? Yeah, so a lot of exercises and a lot of kind of hands-on playing. So I'll explain, you know, spend part of the class lecturing about a certain concept or technique. And then we will go into a time where they're actually um, implementing those concepts and te those techniques over, you know, a piece of music. Because like I say, you always have to be able to apply the, that intellectual knowledge to the instrument, right? It doesn't matter if you have all this knowledge, but you can't apply it to the instrument, that's useless. So always spend time taking those concepts and ideas and saying, okay, now if you have this tune in front of you and you're supposed to perform it, how do you use these concepts on, on this tune? So it's always that kind of you know, practical application of it that I think is, is, is so important. Wow, I guess you don't have any more time to teach uh, individually. Yeah, I still do. I have a few individual students. I mean, I love it when I'm teaching. I love it. It's just the schedule gets to be a little, little difficult at times. So in your genre, which is jazz instrumental, show us how to structure a song. Maybe you can pick uh, one of your songs and how you come up with it. Sure, sure, sure. I wrote, wrote this tune that's actually unnamed. I just kind of use it whenever I need to use it as a piece of music for something. But okay. uh, it's kind of an example of, of how I structure my tunes. The first thing I come up with when I'm writing a tune is just the basic groove. And people use different things. Some people say they come up with chords. Some people say they come up with melodies. They hear a melody in their head. Right. I really don't. I kind of, first of all, kind of think of the groove and the style. So is it a straight ahead swing jazz thing? Or is it a rock tune? Or is it just kind of a inspirational tune? You know, whatever it is. Um, and this tune, I, it was supposed to be kind of a, an inspirational tune, kind of getting people to feel up about themselves. I, I was hired to do this for a project. So I wrote this tune. And the first thing I thought about was the groove. So I kind of came up with this groove that's, I mean, I didn't come up with it, but it's a, a groove that you hear often in this kind of thing. And it's this kind of groove. So that you can imagine the you know drums dun, 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 dun. bass players probably playing you know boom whole notes or whatever um, yeah. under that and so that's the first thing I came up with is that kind of groove so I felt okay this is where we're gonna start and I found a key key of F um, and then I just started putting chords to that so I said if this is it. <laughs> to the sixth minor 
four major seven, then the five. So I came up with that progression, one, six, four, five, which is typical, everybody uses that. Right. But, um, but thought about that as the kind of basis to, to kind of launch us off. Um, and then I came up with this melody that goes, So that's based on those those chords one six uh, four five and just that is just a matter of playing the, the the chords on piano and in my mind then i came up with a melody kind of sung it and then wrote it down mm. and that was the basis of that first part of it and then i thought now it needs to go from that groove which is kind of sustained into more of a rock groove where it kind of takes off so then i said the first thing i need to do is probably this the chords kind of last a long time so double up the chords the chords come quicker so the second part which we call i guess kind of the uh chorus section of it is the chords come quicker and the groove is different it's no longer it's just this kind of kind of a typical rock groove right into that groove so then the chords, i like that yeah the chords going Repeat that progression, and then and after the eight bars, it that's that second section. So now, as you the, the chords are coming much quicker, the groove has changed, and in fact, um, the chords kind of descend. It goes B flat, F over A, A flat major seven, G minor seven, and then I put a melody to it. And I thought, since the chords are coming quicker, maybe I should have a simpler melody line to kind of go along with the chords being more active. So the melody line is real simple. The melody line is. Right, so very, very simple melody line. And then it goes, I thought, then we're gonna repeat back to the one, six, four, five. And then that, goes back to the original groove. Then I thought, this is the last thing, then I thought we need something that's completely different from both grooves, the, mm. the kind of open groove and the rock groove in, in a kind of a floaty groove move. Because I thought if this is kind of an inspirational tune, you want this kind of, a lot of people kind of feel like they're in kind of suspension and then all of a sudden it goes into this you know, kind of a climax to the tune. So I thought we need one of those sections that's kind of floaty. So this goes into a completely different key. I go from, we're in F and I'm not going to D flat. And then I put this floaty section where the drums no longer play a rock groove, but play kind of a floaty, cymbally kind of uh, groove. And it's like, um, Soul over the section, then the next one. Solo over this section, and then the final. And then a little turn around to get us back up to the top. And then we go back up to the original groove. So it kind of nice. has a slowly section that leads us back into the original, uh, you know, kind of group that I came up with. So it changes keys. I thought about changing the duration of the chords. The melody kind of had to do with that. And um, let me just put it all together so you can see kind of yes, how. Yes, yes, please. So it starts out with.
that's the whole tune. So that's kind of how I came up with that. It's just, you know, first of all, the groove, then the harmony, and then finally the melody, and then figured out, okay, I've written the first section. Now, how do I want to change for the chorus or the, the B section of it? And then do I need like a bridge or a C section to kind of even have more contrast? And in this case, I decided to do that and then figuring a way to put them all together. I was going to ask you, what's the key to the creating the masterpiece like that? But I think you said it right. It's contrast and it's just di different mood, different sections. And it's just dynamic, unlike other popular songs that you hear a lot these days. Yeah. And, you know, I think instrumental music especially has to do that because there aren't lyrics to kind of describe what you want to feel or what you want the audience to feel, right? right? You have right. to do it instrumentally. So as an instrumental composer, I really am trying to think to myself, okay, how am I going to create this mood? What do I have to do with the harmony or the melody or the groove to create the mood for the audience? Because there's no kind of blatant lyric for them to go, oh, that's what he means. I got to do it through the instruments, right? Right. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Are you working on something new? Yes, my trio is just about to release our new CD. Mostly original tunes, a few covers, but tunes written by, by the bassist Bob Elefante and myself, featuring great, great saxophones, Doug Webb, one of the great saxophones here in LA, Doug Webb. He's on a few cuts. And we have a tap dancer with his name, Sam Katz. And tap Sam Katz, yeah, taps to a Thelonious Monk tune. Um, and I love the way it came out. So it's... Oh. it's yeah, it's going to be interesting. We went into the studio and mic'd the floor. So she tapped on the on this, uh, you know, wooden panel and was able to pick it up on the mics really clearly so you can hear her tap. She takes a solo, she plays the melody, and she kind of plays time between uh, behind our solos. And it's really, really fun. Wow, that's Maybe. exciting. Congratulations. Okay, so this is going to be the last question. Yes. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the advice I would have given me that, that I don't, this is, a, this is a skill that I do not have. Outside of singing, I would love to be able to sing. I, maybe I would have given my advice to take singing lessons. But outside of that, I would have given myself advice to, to embrace and learn about the newest technology. Because I learned on acoustic piano, um, and when I play, I, I play with keyboards because not every place has a, has a piano, so I'll use my keyboards. I have, I have keyboards. I know how to use the keyboards, and I can get basic synth sounds. But in terms of all the sequencing things and the fancy things that, that a lot of people are doing with uh, home recording and even with the synthesizer, I really don't know how to do. And I'm at a disadvantage now in the modern day, yeah, day of modern technology to be able to do those things. Um, I can learn, but you know, I'm at the age now where it's kind of, you know, I'm going like, well, I'm making a living doing what I'm doing. So do I want to put in all this extra time to learn a new skill? And I don't know that I necessarily want to do that, even though I should. Um, but one of the things is like home recording. I would love to have a studio and a home recording system so that I could record efficiently and professionally here at home uh, tracks for other people. I don't really know how to do that and how to put that together. Um, so the recording I do is I'm always going to studios, you know, real brick and mortar studios to do my recording. And I could probably um, save a lot of money, get a lot much, much more work if I did it out of a home studio, but I just don't have a home studio. Um, and just in terms of like all, you know, those sequencing things with keyboards, I don't know how to do that. Like if I were to be called to do like some kind of hip hop thing and I'm sequencing stuff on keyboards, I'd be totally out You would be so great. It's just a generation gap. You're from old school. Yeah, absolutely. From the old school. I think that's the advice I would give myself is to embrace the new technology. Of course, back when I was 20, we didn't have this technology. So I wouldn't have known. But to just say in the future, if things were to come up having to do with technology, to embrace it and don't shy away from it. I think I would have done that and I would have I would have been now at least able to do those things. But I have to say also just a plug for the old school because some, some musicians my age that, are, that come from that old school and there's something to be said for just being able to play an acoustic instrument and doing it and learning on it 
and and getting your technique off of it rather than doing the whole keyboard route because i know some players that's all they do and they don't have the technique to sit down at a grand piano and play the piano fully and old school folks can always do that because we learned on the acoustic grand piano so um those types of things are the benefit i guess of of kind of concentrating on the old school and the 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 last thing about that is i just love the old school mentality of of paying your dues I love that a lot of musicians of my generation have done all the weddings and all the company parties and then the clubs and even the small clubs and the clubs that didn't pay you very much and where you had, you know, people not listening to you and just paying your dues. And I just think it makes you a more soulful and mature musician mm -hmm. having to gone through that than if you were to just get on The Voice or American Idol, and all of a sudden the next day you're a big star. They haven't paid their dues. And I have a feeling as they go through their music career, there's something missing. And that's that paying your dues and just being in the trenches and working and doing music all that time. And it just I just think it has an influence on how you sound and how you play. And you just sound more mature. And I, I would argue even more kind of soulful because you've kind of been through it all. So that's my plug for us old guys. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. Well, thank you so much, Ron, today for oh, your to insights you. and beautiful playing. Thank you. I so appreciate you asking. And until we meet again, sayonara. Sayonara. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Don't forget to click subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about new videos of Songwriter's Room or my new music or Japan news series. Thank you for watching. Arigatou. Sayonara.